Hi guys. Well, it is finally cooling off with a little bit of rain after a sweltering summer day. Uh, finally, in the dog days of August, that would be Tuesday, August 11th, 2020, I believe, uh, here in at Bugs in a Jar Farm outside of Ithaca, New York. I am Sam Mitchell. This is my little co-pilot. Sancho Panza, and I've been thinking all day while working out in the hot sun about doing a rant about that scene up in Chicago yesterday where we had Mad Max and climate change catastrophe meeting in Chicago, Illinois yesterday. It was a, anybody uh, not understanding what uh, the collapse of global industrial civilization, everything from the, the, the society to the planet, just needs to look at those raised drawbridges in Chicago, Illinois in the summer of 2020 to understand what collapse looks like. But I, I don't know, guys. I just can't put it together. Maybe it'll show up elsewhere in the Doomosphere. <clears throat> so... Uh, I did have the pleasure today, I took a break from digging sand in the hot sun where I got to talk with uh, my old buddy Terry Spar from Earth Overshoot. So uh, I'm going to air that interview uh, on August 22nd, which will be Earth Overshoot Day 2020. So we're going to talk to Terry. But... Uh, I did want to share this. I've, I, I've, and, 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 and even this, little dog, you're gonna have to. I don't know if you, if, if you guys can see this, uh, this graphic. I've, I've, how many times have I showed this graphic? Let's see if we can figure out how to make this a little bit bigger. So what Terry has done here. Uh, has shown the top ways to reduce your carbon footprint. But assuming you can see this, uh, this top line, which far outweighs anything else on your top 10 ways, this is really... Uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't really show the true story. And of course, what the line represents is the number one way to reduce your carbon footprint is to have one fewer child. And then, of course, if you have no children, this bar goes to zero. But the, the bar actually goes to 60 you know, it's broken, and the first part of the line is just goes up to like three. So the bar for the decision to have one fewer child, and, and then as I say, the uh, this decision to have no children would take the bar, <clears throat> you know, completely off the map. Uh, so it rates a 60. <clears throat> so, okay. So... Live car free. Okay, have one fewer child. Uh, you, you give yourself 60 points for saving the planet. Living car free, give yourself two and a half points. Avoiding one round trip transatlantic flight, give yourself one and a half points. Buy green energy. Green energy give yourself one and a half points. Buy a more efficient car, give yourself a little bit over one point, switch from an electric car to car free, then uh, that kind of ties in with number two, give yourself a little bit over one point. Eat a plant-based diet, otherwise become a vegan. Get animal products out of your diet, 
That'll give you about three quarters of one point. So not having for each fewer children you have, give yourself 60 points. Going vegan, give yourself three-fourths of one point. So uh, going vegan uh, does, you could go, so what is it saying? Like 80 people, 80, 80 non-breeders could go vegan according to the environmental footprint here. You could have 80 non breeders uh, I'm, I'm losing my math here uh, what, what, what am I uh, I'm trying to figure out anyway you can do the math yourself you, you know what that that one vegan having one child is doing more damage to this planet than 80 meat-eating non-breeders Okay, this is uh, anybody thinking, and, and don't get me wrong, I am fully cheering on vegans. Anybody thinking their vegan diet, <clears throat> replace gasoline car with hybrid, give yourself about a half a point, wash clothes in cold water, give yourself about a third of a point. Here is recycling. Recycling has become such an absolute joke on this planet. It is now <clears throat> worth about one-fourth of one point that you are doing 240 times more for the planet by having one less child than you are for recycling for your entire lifetime hang drying your clothes about one fourth of one point and of course upgrading your light bulbs uh, to LEDs give yourself about one tenth of one point so uh, 500 people could upgrade their light bulbs and that would do about as much to save the planet as uh, as one person or couple, I guess it should be, not breeding. Uh, not having a child is, uh, is the one and the only thing, personal uh, consumer and lifestyle choice you can make to do anything to save the planet. So, uh, this is, I guess, this is earthovershoot.org answering the question, if we are consuming too much and there are too many people on our planet, what will eventually happen? Okay. If we continue to ignore the problem, then eventually nature will force it upon us Perhaps unexpectedly or violently, the signs are all around us that the planet and nature are exhibiting immense stress. Many highly regarded independent scientists and ac academicians, academicians, you know what uh, we personally have spoken with and interviewed, <clears throat> state that by the second half of this century, implications for a correction in global energy availability that drives our civilization are undeniable. By 2100, ocean acidification will reach levels that will drastically alter whatever sea life is left at the time. Global warming will wreak havoc on land and in the sea. The lands will be devoid of most forest and animals will be regularly going extinct. Humans will be unable to use land that has been transformed by saltwater intrusion or live in areas devoid of nature. 
fresh water, and fertile soils. Humans, as well as all Earth's creatures, will suffer greatly unless we forthrightly acknowledge these crises and take serious steps to prevent them. Oh yes, uh, you can see that happening, these serious steps we're taking, but anyway, be sure to listen to my interview with Terry Sparr on uh, August 22nd, and then I wanted to read a little bit from this article in The Guardian by a woman named Victoria Herman uh, today. Victoria is the president and managing director of the Arctic Institute, and her essay today, As the Tundra Burns, We Cannot Afford Climate Silence, a letter from the Arctic. So uh, take it away, Victoria, and tell us what it used to feel like standing on the tundra. When you stand facing an exposed edge of permafrost, you can feel it from a distance. It emanates a cold that tugs on every one of your senses, permanently bound by ice year after year. The frozen soil is packed with carcasses of woolly mammoths and ancient ferns. They are unable to decompose at such low temperatures so that they stay preserved in perpetuity until warmer air thaws their remains and releases the cold that they have cradled for centuries. And um, so she talks about her first trip to the tundra uh, just four years ago uh, and what is uh, how much the permafrost has collapsed in the past four years. The northern hemisphere is covered by nine million square miles of permafrost, which of course should be called tempafrost. This solid ground and all the organic material it contains is one of the largest greenhouse gas stores on the planet. I think it is the largest, perhaps, at least on land. Frozen, it poses little threat to the four million people that call the Arctic home or to the 7.8 billion of us that call Earth home, but defrosted by rising temperatures, thawing permafrost poses a planetary risk. When the organic material begins to decompose, permafrost thaw can destabilize major infrastructure discharge mercury levels dangerous to human health and release billions of metric tons of carbon. Carbon. We witnessed small scale damage in Russia in the summer of 2016 through slumped landscapes and uneven roads. At that time, the larger, more dramatic changes were predicted, this is four years ago, were predicted to unfold over the course of this century. Four years later, those changes are happening much sooner than scientists predicted. The carbon-laden cold of the Arctic's permafrost is leaking into Earth's atmosphere, and we are not ready for the consequences. In June, the Russian Arctic reached 100 degrees, the highest temperature in the Arctic since record keeping began. The heat shocked uh, scientists, but was not a unique or unusual event in a climate changed world. The Arctic is warming at nearly three times the rate of the global average, and June's single day high was part of a month-long heat wave. This relentless heat has melted sea ice and made traditional subsistence dangerous for skilled indigenous hunters. It has fueled costly wildfires, which some of which are so strong that they now last from one summer to the next, 
and it has sped up permafrost thaw, buckling roads and displacing entire communities. Uh, watching the heat of 2020 devastate the Arctic, I think back to the fear we experienced while watching the permafrost thaw in 2016, but I also remember feeling hopeful. It is much harder to find hope today than it was four years ago, but it's not impossible. Well, I don't know what it's going to take for this woman to find it impossible to find hope. Uh, I guess these are a few of the way reasons Victoria finds it uh, not impossible to find hope. Okay, the Arctic skies are blackened with wildfire smoke, and we are not even halfway through the summer. The Trump administration has reversed 100 environmental rules. Yes. Uh, how about climate change cannot be stopped? The Arctic's ice will melt and large swaths of frozen ground will fall. Climate change is already causing devastating loss of life destroying irreplaceable cultural heritage and inundating the places we hold dear. With every degree we allow our world to warm, the more we lose. But by demanding climate action from our governments and demanding climate action from ourselves, we can work today to avert <coughs> the worst damage and adapt to the impacts we can no longer avoid. Yes, as the Arctic burns, we cannot afford climate silence from anyone, including Book Hermit. The cost of inaction is too high. Thank you, Victoria, for your little sermon there. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to adapt to the sweat running down my face here uh, by making me an ice-cold margarita uh, here to welcome uh, nightfall in paradise at Bugs in a Jar Farm. And I encourage you to uh, make yourself an ice-cold alcoholic beverage while you still can before Chicago, Illinois finds your own slice of paradise. Bye guys. Nice little dog. Are you ready for a margarita? <laughs>